Education, especially Didan Buhari Gunmas and uh, Professor Harry Papasutiriu, the head of the Institute of IR in Athens and Global Affairs Journal, which is a journal of a Euro European International Studies Association for their support. We are looking forward to hearing this exciting discussion. We will now present our keynote speakers. There are um, Aslı Ergül Jorgensen and Knut Erik Jorgensen, who will represent, present their uh, recent article on Europe realism published by International Rela Relations Journal. Um, Peride Aslı Ergül Jorgensen is an assi assistant professor at Ege University in Turkey. She was a visiting researcher at Arthur's University in Denmark, at IBEI in Spain, and at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. She is involved in the Cost Enter Network as a working group leader. Her res uh, research interests include IR theory, liberal international theory, English school, the Middle East, uh, and identity studies. Her most recent publication, uh, publications include, among others, a uh, Paul Gray book chapter titled When Liberalism Meets the English School, and a co-author article published by Mediterranean Politics titled Different Than Us, a reciprocal per perception of the societies in Turkey and North uh, Cyprus, Professor Knut Erik Jorgensen is a professor at Arthur's University in Denmark. He is a co-editor of the book series um, Paul Grave Studies in International Relations and the European Union in International Affairs, as well as the journal Global Affairs. He published articles in several journals, such as European Journal of International Relations, Journal uh, of European Integration, Journal of European Public Policy, Cooperation and Conflict. He published several books on IR theory and EU foreign policy. His most recent book is The Liberal International Theory Tradition in Europe. He is involved in the Cost Enter Network, the EU NPD Network, and EU. Uh, Diplo research project on the EEAS. I uh, leave the floor to you, uh, dear Asla Ergül Jorgensen and Knut Erik Jorgensen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers. Um, for this uh, really uh, nice event. It's actually a privilege for us to be here. So uh, Didem Ocam, Bezen Ocam, uh, thank you for organizing. And Professor Harry Papasutrio, and also Effie uh, for organizing and bringing us together and Alex uh, for uh, accepting to be the discussant. And of course, all the other participants. Uh, I also would like to, uh, of course, uh, thank uh, Idis, uh, and Global Affairs, and uh, last but not least, Academicus, for this uh, really, uh, for their time, for their effort, and for their really motivation for this. Thank you, Academicus. Okay, so I would like to uh, just give uh, some outline. It's an, an outline for actually our uh, uh, article uh, and it's a uh, title as you know realist theories in search of realists so this article uh, is actually about uh, the, the, it's discussing the failure in europe to advance realist theory and uh, let me be clear about some point uh, about this point that actually uh, we do not claim that uh, realism lost its dominance in europe we actually claim that it has never been dominant in Europe. So this is what we claim. And uh, after this uh, uh, bold uh, opening, let me actually also say what this article is not about. Because uh, as a person who also works uh, identity, it is I always believe that before you tell yourself, you need to tell who you are not. So what? Uh, this article is not about is important for the discussion here. So the, this article is not about actually the worldwide realist theory. So we are not uh, dealing with America, Asia, Africa, but 
Europe. So this is the focal point for us. And this is not about uh, individual studies, uh, individual merit studies, uh, but about actually the theoretical tradition here. So we actually talk uh, realism uh, as a tradition. Uh, so it's not like, you know, it's that person, this person. So, and the third thing that uh, this article is not about is that it is not about the whole history uh, of the realist tradition, which can go back to, you know, ancient city-states like Thucydides or Hobbes or Machiavelli. So this is actually we uh, specifically focus on the last hundred years. Uh, so we the, the, the limited uh, the uh, view uh, within this hundred years. So after uh, knowing what we are not talking about, let's also talk about what we are talking about. Okay, so uh, so the article is about the end game of the realists or the realist tradition in Europe. The end game. So obviously we are talking about a failure of the realist. Uh, theorists in Europe, or uh, let's say people who believe that they are uh, realists, but actually they are not, maybe in parentheses, we can discuss, of course. So there are three arguments of this article. Uh, so the first one is that realism never enjoyed a strong position in Europe. So there is no golden era, golden age of realism at some point in Europe. So there is no, uh, let's turn back to good days. So because uh, it has a limited conceptual theoretical innovation. So this can, of course, this is explained uh, uh, I mean, with some uh, examples from history. Uh, let me maybe just slightly say that actually the concepts of uh, you know, power, state, or, you know, uh, raison d'etat, or this kind of, you know, the understanding of um, uh, materialism, to some extent, uh, were actually mainly taken from, let's say, German Machschule, it's like between actually the 1848 to the Second World War, uh, time, uh, period of Europe, uh, the philosophical production in Europe, which is pre-realism in this sense, were actually uh, very influent influential uh, on creating, in creating the realist theory. So the German Schule, German historicism, even uh, Ranke and his bold claim about simply describing the world as it is or Mosca and Pareto's, uh, I mean, the so Italian sociologist power analysis, um, or uh, even actually Marxism and its materialism. So we are not, of course, claiming that realism is uh, directly following uh, these traditions, but obviously they are inspired deeply. So the conceptual building blocks of realism were actually taken from pre-realist times, uh, the sociologists, the historians, uh, the economists even. So, uh, and I guess this makes more sense uh, than this far-fetched connection to Machiavelli or Hobbes in our understanding. And the uh, second argument of our article is that, um, uh, that we see the tradition's capacity to generate new theories seems uh, unlikely. So, uh, we try to be uh, kind here, of course. So traditions, uh, uh, I mean, the, the repre representatives of uh, realism, I, they, they seem a little bit unable or unwilling to uh, spin off concrete applicable theories. So applicable theory is important here because it means living tradition. So is realism still uh, or is it even a living tradition? So is it dynamic enough? Is it innovative enough as Anderson claims? Or is it really connecting uh, the, uh, or is there a good connection between the continuity and change in, uh, in the philosophical understanding? So of course it is twofold. What we are saying is this living tradition. So the one uh, aspect is it's empirical explanatory analysis. This is really critical. I guess 
uh, there is actually a problem about this in realist tradition. And the second one is constitutive normative theorizing. So I guess these both uh, aspects should be uh, strong together in order to actually uh, run um, uh, and kick, I mean, a, a living and kicking theory. So, uh, and I guess in this sense, uh, maybe uh, it's maybe the Boozen, uh, Jones and Little's uh, arguments, uh, I mean, reconstruction of neorealism uh, could be, I guess, uh, we, I mean, we agree, we claim that uh, the last prominent examples here. So after them, unfortunately, we didn't see any convincing, uh, innovative, uh, realist uh, uh, production theoretical production. And the third argument is uh, about that uh, is that realists have been unable to un uh, adjust their research agenda to current challenges and produce relatively few comprehensive empirical studies. So it is about also the uh, you know, the, the people who are in charge of uh, continuing uh, keeping realism alive. So uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we see very limited analysis about what is going on in the international system. I am not talking about foreign policy analysis. I'm not talking about uh, just case by, by case explanation of uh, foreign policy analysis as you Remember, Kenneth Walsh's actually differentiation here. Foreign policy is different than international relations. Uh, so there's a difference. So if uh, we actually take these arguments, you can actually um, uh, have the glimpse, a general glimpse of what we are really meaning, what we really argue. And uh, we also additionally say, so instead of these points, which are crucial for realism, we actually see uh, some trends in realism in Europe. So the first one is that uh, there is, instead of innovative, productive, uh, realist analysis of world politics, there is actually an insistence of meta studies on realism. So this is, and even actually this part, this meta studies um, is mainly given, I mean, this genre is even uh, ceased to the outside people who are not realists. They are actually, there's a tendency that uh, the people working on realism as a meta theory, and uh, I am not sure that we can call them, uh, not even not all of them as realists. So, the first one we see is the meta study uh, tendency. Maybe it's too much overwhelming here. And the second one is retrospective uh, studies, which is actually, I mean, these are really important uh, research uh, frameworks. Obviously they uh, contribute into production, but they are not on their own creating and producing realism. So the retrospective studies are, you know, rediscovering the qualities of especially classical realist scholars. So, and we are not sure that rediscovering the already discovered people and arguments is enough for, uh, you know, production of realist uh, theory. And another one uh, that we see uh, as a tendency among the realists in Europe is actually this uh, orientation uh, uh, or the, the, um, the, the, uh, the central position of foreign policy orientations, which actually sounds more like ideology. It's like legitimacy of governments. So, uh, so these are actually, I mean, um, and this is, uh, also at the same time, a little bit questionable, by the way, because this is a tendency to replace sound theorizing uh, with political commitments. So this is also something, this is a tendency. And another, of course, thing, um, uh, may, maybe not a tendency, but uh, it's like a habit among the uh, realists or even um, some conservative minds in IR theory is to, op to uh, is actually done by the authors, uh, the textbook authors of IR theory. So uh, the authors tend to present realism as a 
very prominent, if not dominant, theory of IR. I mean, uh, first, I'm also teaching uh, theory uh, in my department, and uh, we are reading this uh, Globalization of World Politics, very popular book written by Bailey, Smith, and Owens. And in this one, uh, except for the shift of uh, idealism, I mean, actually, no, they say liberalism and realism, uh, the others more or less continue a chronological order. I mean, it's uh, like constructivism, post-positivism. So you can feel a chronological feeling there, but when it comes to realism, they put it uh, as a beginning uh, theory. And this is not, of course, an exception. This is a very common tendency in uh, the textbooks of IR, so which also actually present and maybe uh, give this misunderstanding uh, about realism. So, uh, so in summary, uh, let me finish. I hope I didn't take too much time. I can sometimes uh, lose the track of time. So in summary, what we found is a limited theoretical advance of realism in Europe and few comprehensive empirical studies and excessive interest uh, in meta study and a questionable, as I said, questionable tendency to replace sound theorizing with political commitments. So I would like to thank you for listening to me. Uh, maybe Kunoderik would like to add some uh, parts here. Ah, sorry. I guess there's an Ojam, yes. Just... No, 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 I'm just clapping. <laughs> ah, sorry. Sorry, I thought it's a race. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you. Yes, please, Kundalik. Just a very few comments uh, additional uh, because it was such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, John Mearsheim claimed in his uh, usual provocative style that um, there are no realists in Europe. And basically, that is what uh, sort of... Uh, set it off. Uh, that is what, uh, that is our starting point. Because we believe, as uh, we have uh, now uh, written 12,000 words about, that he's right. And we, we uh, try to substantiate his claim. And we, we spend all those words uh, to do so. Uh, but basically, that is what we're doing. And of course, we also ask ourselves, okay, why is it that it could go that bad? And um, I guess one of the very important uh, reasons that uh, the realist tradition has had such a difficult time in Europe is uh, this uh, massive exodus of prominent theorists in the 1930s who were going to primarily America, put out tent, established themselves as uh, very important scholars and didn't return to Europe. So in a sense, what was sort of a, could be seen as a very promising beginning of a tradition in Europe, lost its traction due to prosecution, due to uh, a very understandable wish to avoid being killed uh, by uh, Nazis or fascists. So this exodus, uh, which of course um, Alex has uh, written uh, comprehensively about, uh, also his, uh, our colleague uh, Felix Rösch has uh, pointed to this uh, transfer of people from the European continent and to primarily America. That is one of the main factors, as it seems to me. Then after the Second World War, why is it that then they didn't pick up the, the sort of the, the tradition? And I think to some degree, it is due to the fact that realism by then was to some degree discredited. After all, E.H. Carr had uh, promoted uh, appeasement this was not the right thing to, uh, sort of right position to have after the Second World War. And uh, this uh, preoccupation with power and, uh, and power politics in Europe after the Second World War, where Europe was almost destroyed, had destroyed itself, was not really what uh, was sort of seen as the intellectual guiding star. So this is what we do. And then uh, along the way, of course, uh, we also point out that uh, there are some scholars of a realist orientation, even eminent theorists, 
who simply decided to leave the realist tradition and move somewhere else. And some of these prominent examples, uh, I guess, are uh, Barabusan that uh, Osler mentioned, also Steve Smith and others, who found that, okay, um, we have uh, seen what realism can contribute with, and we have decided that it's, uh, it's enough for us, and we go elsewhere, typically to the English school. And I think uh, this uh, sort of uh, just rounds up uh, our presentation. Then uh, we have uh, lots of things to add, but uh, let's, um, let's uh, move on to, uh, to hear what uh, Alex uh, has, to, uh, has to say. Thanks. So thank you. Then uh, let me introduce you our uh, moderator and discussant right now. Uh, our discussant is uh, Dr. Alex Rahwein will, uh, will be our discussant today. He's a lecturer of international relations at Giessen University in Germany. He holds a PhD on Morgenthau's realism from the Goethe University of Frankfurt. He taught at the University of Copenhagen and the University of Erfurt as a guest lecturer. He is a co-editor of the Paul Gray book series titled Trends in European IR Theory. And Dr. Vezan Balamir Joshkun from TED University uh, will kindly be our moderator today. Thank you. Okay, now it's up to me to discuss. Okay, yeah, hello everybody. In order to save some time, I, I, I would like to thank to everybody um, to organize this and to invite me. Uh, great pleasure to see uh, Asli and Knut Eric again because we know each other for a couple of years and we are working close together. And I'm also happy to see new people and new faces. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a very good um, uh, end of a, of a day at the university after a lost football game, which is not normal in Germany. So I'm uh, in a kind of emotional imbalance uh, and realism maybe brings me back to an uh, emotional balance uh, and I can enjoy the Italian game this evening with Eric at the pizzeria for sure. You will see it via Facebook maybe. Okay, let's start uh, with um, the stuff we, uh, we uh, should talk about. Uh, first of all, um, I have five explanations why realism is so to say, not so dominant in Europe. And to Eric, you mentioned already two uh, explanations, but I will add something. But let me start uh, because I, I, uh, I did uh, prepare myself um, by means of a uh, kind of agenda. I have um, five points. And the first point is, um, how did I read this article? Because I did read it uh, already a couple of weeks ago and I did cite it in our realism book, in our um, trends um, uh, in European IR theory uh, volume on realism. And um, uh, the first impression um, I, I got a couple of uh, months or weeks ago was, what a provocation. This is very provocative and this is the best you can get because you played the John Mersheimer part, so to say. Yeah? Uh, um, and um, then I, I thought, well, it's very thought provoking because I think you are not wrong. You are not completely right, I think, because uh, otherwise it would be very boring, this uh, event here. And I, I, I want to uh, share some agreements and some disagreements with you. But uh, there is um, something in the article which I think is, in fact, a problem for realism or for realists or for scholars like me working on the realist tradition. And the third and last uh, idea which came to my mind uh, reading this article for the very first time was that I understand your article not as an, so to say, affirmative swan song or as an end of realism, because I think, Knut Eric, that you and us, you, you want to provoke people like me to identify themselves as realists and to work as realists on realism. And so I would give the uh, article and subtitle, would the real European realists please stand up? And I will stand up now and try to play the role of a European realist because I know, Clued Eric, since a couple of years, you asked me at all conferences to start 
to be a realist and not only to work on realism. I do not know why, but it seems to me that this is your and also Asli's, so to say, normative um, idea no? or, or claim. And I will take this very seriously, to be honest. So I read your article as a thought-provoking call that the realists should please stand up. Point number one. I hope you can hear me. Okay, that's okay. Um, second, there are a lot of disagreements, I think, between your presentation in the article and my, um, how to say, understanding of the state of the art of realism uh, in Europe. First of all, realism is not a single tradition, as you all know. We have classical realists, we have neorealists, we have neoclassical realists, we have European realists, we have American realists, and we have realists in all other parts of the world in the meantime. We have realists doing IR theory, as we, and we have realists doing foreign policy analysis, and we have realists misusing and instrumentalizing realism for a crude, reckless power politics in Russia, for example, or in other parts of the world. So I will come back to this later. And this is a great challenge uh, for us because this means that we have, first of all, identify very clearly what do we mean when we talk about realism and you you, you you did it in your article because your first part is on what does it need to be a tradition and then you you talk about the classical and the nearest because you are very familiar and very aware uh, 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 um, of the realist tradition you means asli and Tunderic. so this is not my my disagreement or my critique this is my starting point and then I would like to add only uh, three points. First of all, you say there is no theoretical innovation. And I would answer there is. Uh, this year, there was this International Studies Review Forum on Neoclassical Realism uh, with uh, Gustav Maybauer and my part and some other people, Tudor Onea from Turkey. So there are a couple of European realists trying to start a theoretical innovational um, how to say, endeavor to bring a European strand of neoclassical realism, which is either, um, so to say, um, picking up of classical or picking up of neorealism together. And there are some other examples, which I will not mention now. So my argument is there is something on the move and maybe your article has provoked this move. Maybe, I, I do not know. Um, second, you argue that there is no um, history about realist IR theorizing, I would answer there is, Rösch and Reichwein, for example, and some other people, but this is not your point, whether there are two or three or five, you are right, that there should be a much more stronger and much more dominant realist family of IR scholars in Europe, given the fact that realism is a European tradition, which you are mentioning in your article. So you're right. And maybe this has to be explained. I will come to this back later. And my third point, when it comes to my rather disagreeing arguments that there is no realist family, no realist tradition, no theoretical innovation, is that you mention or you argue that realists working on realism, like Battistella and other people, are not so aware of each other. Well, I did organize a lot of conferences in the last couple of years uh, at ISA and Avis and so on, where European realists meet again and again and again. So I ask you, what does it need uh, to be established or realized or recognized as a European IR family? Does it need two articles in IS or IO? Does it need uh, some more edited volumes? Does it need much more um, panels? I'm rather provoking now. I, I hope you understand my, my, my smile, so to say. So I would argue there is something on the move since a couple of, 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 of years where realists from Denmark, Anders Wevel, uh, and from Germany, and from UK, and from Turkey, and from other parts of Europe organize themselves, be very well aware of each other, uh, sharing emails uh, and Facebook, uh, uh, social media networks, and so on and so forth and trying to do exactly what you both are calling for, to establish a European IR group of scholars working either as or working on realism and realists, working either as realists on realism, so to say. 
Um, I think you are right uh, with your third point that there is no empirical um, studies um, uh, from a realist perspective on conflicts, globalization, and so on and so forth. I will come back to this later. They are just meta theory. Yes, you're right. So my third point is that we are uh, in need of explanations uh, for this development, which you are figuring uh, out in your article. And I really enjoyed reading this article, even though this article is very critical about uh, the work um, I'm doing, not critical about my work, but critical about the work about or on realism. And I think you have some very good points for sure. So Knut, Eric, you mentioned the first reason for this. Uh, Europe, uh, realism did leave Europe for quite obvious reasons. It was the forced uh, migration or emigration and Felix Rösch and other people did publish a lot about this. So Hans Morgenthau became an US American IR realist scholar. And what is very uh, quite amazing is the fact that he denied his German roots and backgrounds. Ned LeBeau did uh, write uh, a lot of articles about this. So European realism became US American realism. This is my argument in our realism volume. And this is bad luck or this is plausible. This was a kind of rational choice. This was a strategy for survival. You can name it as you want. But this is one, and Eric, you mentioned this, uh, explanation for the fact that realism was out of Europe since the late 30s. The second uh, reason uh, uh, for the, how to say, non-dominance or non-visibility of realism in Europe during the Cold War, because this is your uh, organization of your article, uh, the 30s and then uh, during the Cold War and then after the Cold War, which is a very strategic uh, choice, so to say, is that first of all, Knut Eric, you mentioned realism was uh, discredited because of Carr's appeasement policy, Hitler was a rational actor, Stalin was a good alternative, and so on and so forth. So Carr was a very crazy realist. And to be honest, he was the only classical realist who was neither a Jew, nor a German, nor a continental European. So maybe this explains why Carr did all this crazy stuff. He was a liberal Marxist, rich, uh, grew up in a liberal environment, and read Ned LeBeau, who distinguished Carr and Morgenthau and Arendt very sharply, and I do the same. Carr was Carr, and Carr was not a realist in my understanding, so to say. He was a very, very, very unique realist. So I would add something to this. Um, during the Cold War, uh, realism was not only uh, discredited in Europe because of Carr, but also because of the link between realism and power politics, because most of people misunderstand until today realism as an affirmative theory about power politics. And what I do in my publications is to rather argue the contrary and to say realism is about power politics because realists believe not in power politics. They believe that this is the, how to say, law of international politics. And then they argue against crude, reckless, ideological driven uh, military power politics, as you all know. So I would argue that in Germany, Realism was not existent. I mean, could I talk with Lothar Brock and all these other great peace researchers? Realism was not on the agenda because they do not want to teach realism, because even Lothar and other people did, so to say, make a, um, a link between power politics, which was forbidden in Germany for quite good and obvious reasons, and realism. And this has changed end of the 90s with Christoph Frey's Arbeit on Morgenthau, and then the all uh, the other uh, work, which was um, following this. So my argument would be in Germany, it is rather clear that there are no realists uh, until today. And I grew up in the German IR uh, debate. Uh, and it took me two years uh, until uh, someone in the seminar introduced realism to us. I was quite uh, surprised about it because I've never heard about realism before. And then it was introduced as an American theory by the American scholar Hans Morgenthau. And then I started my own research. And then it took me one day to realize that Morgenthau was a German Frankfurt international lawyer and not an American realist. And then I thought, oh, my professors are lying about realism. There must be something about it. And then I started my research, so to say. And the other point is, during the Cold War, as you all know, Europe was a junior partner of the US and Europe was not involved in own conflicts. Europe was part of this big conflict. And maybe this was the reason why John Mersheimer was not thinking about realism in Europe, but realism in the United States as a strategy to how to say balance Europe. So it has to do with the Cold War. 
And my last point to this uh, uh, question, why is it that there is no realism in Europe is for sure uh, that after the second, uh, the Cold War, and this is your last point in your article, um, there was this, how to say, zeitgeist. This is a very nice wording, I think. Uh, the Kantian zeitgeist, the end of history. It was Fukuyama and US, Japanese, I ask Ola, okay, but in Germany, in Europe, Knut Eric, you know this very well, was this zeitgeist, now everything will be very fine. Democracy, market, uh, economy, and so on and so forth, human rights. And this is exactly the time, the end of 90s, when I started my studies as an IR student. And I, I, I never heard about realism. I heard about constructivism, liberal peace theory, globalization, and so on and so forth. So maybe it has to do with the fact that beside Yugoslavia, there was no conflict in Europe, and this has changed now. And this brings me to my first, to my, to my last point. I think you are right. We need, we need realist uh, perspectives on European affairs because we have the Ukraine crisis. We have Russia as a powerful um, a comebacker, so to say. We have. Uh, still to deal with the Yugoslavian uh, crisis and conflicts and wars. We have uh, a lot of uh, issues on the agenda, which are, uh, so to say, power politics, which has to do with power politics. We have the question whether Europe should be a rather German-French led or a rather um, Eastern Europe led uh, organization. So power politics is all around us, it's everywhere. And though you are right, uh, it's, 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 it's rather um, amazing uh, or it's surprising and you have to explain uh, this. Why is there no realist community in Europe, people like me or other people who explain case A, uh, case B, uh, um, case C, who present empirical studies and so on and so forth. And I think we have to start with this because the Ukrainian crisis, but also the Russian Georgia war uh, did, so to say, remind us that power politics is also in Europe. It's not a way, so to say, at least uh, or, or, or latest since Russia decided to, how to say, be a revisionist state and to reorder, so to say, Eurasia. And also how Europe should deal with China is a realist topic, so to say. And this brings me to my very last point. I think that realists in Europe today, like me, maybe, not like me, just like me, but, but like me as a representative uh, of this group. And I think this is exactly what Knut Eric wants to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to um, identify myself as someone who should do this work. We have conflicts within Europe, but also at the European borders. So this brings realism on the agenda because realism is about conflicts and power politics and how to deal with this. Second point, um, we can very, very, very plausible explain, for example, the permanence of the nation state. It doesn't matter which crisis. At all ends, there is the nation state who has to deal with crisis, so to say. And realists are talking about the nation state. And, and this is my normative and critical part as a Frankfurt IR scholar, we have to warn against the misuse of realism. And this is the point in your article, which I highly celebrate and which I completely agree about. There is a tendency to misuse realism as an affirmative realpolitik justification. And this is something I will write and argue against. So my argument was until a couple of years, we should not leave realism to John Mershire and the offensive part. And now I would argue we should not leave realism to people and it doesn't matter in which capital who misuse realism, either they do not know it better than they should read the classical realist stuff or they know it better, but they try nevertheless to, so to say, use or misuse realism as a justification for power politics. So. We have a lot of stuff to do, and I decided to start with this work tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it was a great start, actually, to our discussion. Um, colleagues, friends, students, uh, my name is Bezan Joshkun, and I will be moderating this event. Before giving floor to the respected colleagues who are, uh, on, uh, who are experts on international theories, 
So I want to congratulate Kunut and Aslı for such a thought-provoking uh, paper and thank Alex for the valuable inputs on, on this article. But before giving floor to uh, our colleagues, so I just want to give like maybe five minutes to Kunut and Aslı to uh, respond Alexander's points, please. Uh. Eric, would you like to uh, take the discussion or I can, maybe, uh, okay. I can uh, uh, share some uh, some of the points that actually you raised uh, on my mind. Uh, Alex, thank you for this really nice discussion and good points about the article. I also agree with uh, what you agree upon, uh, some points of that it is, yes, thought-provoking, yes, uh, the misuse of realism. Uh, and that uh, realism needs uh, much more uh, support and ambition to produce more. Uh, but you also said a sentence, actually, I would like to highlight uh, a sentence that you mentioned, that when you were uh, a young uh, academic or an IR student, uh, that actually uh, at school you didn't uh, learn about realism that uh, you have uh, you haven't heard about it before even that uh, you were taught liberal peace theory constructivism english school i guess this also kind of supports the arguments that we also uh, said here so that's also supporting us here because uh, uh, from the personal experience you bring here uh, makes actually a valuable uh, contribution that yes even the students in europe uh, they actually didn't uh, learn realism because realism was never dominant. So uh, I guess that's what we are already saying. And um, another one um, that uh, you you also mentioned about all these actually uh, projects uh, that you are that the forum uh, about realism, the European realist, and uh, you are part of it, and also others. That is, uh, I guess, these are really good um, and very, uh, I mean, uh, nice contributions into realist uh, tradition, obviously. But uh, they are uh, kind of still limited. Maybe, I don't know. I actually uh, leave this part to Kunderik because he knows about these publications and things. I'm sure that uh, he has his uh, answers here, but I want to uh, uh, mention or uh, answer this part that realism, you mentioned that realism should write more about European Union. I really have doubts about this, the European Union and realism. Um, because I mean, uh, it's predominantly realist theory is talking about you know the um, the the, um, the lack of cooperation. So uh, it is a kind of challenge for realism to talk about cooperation when it comes to this you know uh, functionalism of the EU and even actually some blurred lines around the nation state. So uh, I, uh, I guess we believe uh, here that it's a, it's a kind of challenge, big challenge to talk about the EU even today. Uh, I mean, uh, it was mainly the, um, maybe not, I mean, last year, maybe it's uh, during the Corona times, the first months of the outbreak, uh, there were mainly these realists uh, talking about, see, now it is the end of the EU. Uh, uh, so it was, you know, uh, one of the, you know, big uh, victories in quote uh, of, I mean, this uh, projection of realism that it's end of the EU, uh, so the, because uh, there were these problems about, you know, closing the boundaries and uh, disconnection, and it, Italy was, uh, I mean, looked like a little bit isolated. So these issues were actually taken uh, vigorously by the realists to discuss. So I'm not really sure that actually the realist tradition can um, make uh, more points about the uh, cooperation uh, of the EU or more fragmented uh, Middle East over there. It is even, um, I guess, more split and more challenged today. But uh, I don't think that actually after Volt, uh, we actually read uh, really good theoretical analysis of uh, this fragmented uh, region. So I would like to stop here and uh, give the floor to Kunderik for uh, his comments. Thank you, Asla. Thank you. Maybe I'll just limit myself to, uh, to two comments uh, for now. 
The first one is that um, the diversity in terms of understanding what the realist tradition is uh, within the discipline. The diversity is really sort of a big surprise and uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to understand because we have got uh, many different uh, reactions uh, to, this, uh, to this article. Some come to us and say, why do you care about realism? Realism is so last century. Now we are somewhere else. So why uh, flock a dead horse? Is it worthwhile? Why did you spend time on that? At the very same time, when you ask uh, scholars in Europe which paradigm they see themselves within, okay, there's also great diversity. But it is striking that, for example, in France and Italy, up to 25% of scholars interviewed say that realism is my thing. How that is combinable with the fact that the output in terms of articles, uh, theoretical uh, contributions, uh, major studies are so limited, very difficult to understand, or put differently, how do they understand realism when they ask, when they say that, okay, I see myself in that tradition. I guess that is the puzzling question. Second comment is that um, uh, Alex uh, rightly pointed out that uh, there has recently been one initiative where a bunch of uh, scholars have got together and uh, published on unrealism. I guess uh, our short response is that um, one bird does not make a summer. It takes more than just a special issue or a book to keep a tradition alive. Because it seems that the one book or the one special issue is the exception, not the rule. And third, uh, third comment is about what, uh, what we would like to see or which indicators we have for saying that it seems that realists in Europe are a disunited uh, group of scholars who are not too much in touch with, with each other. And I think one of the indicators is that if you read articles by realists based in Europe, then there would be at least 100 citations to Gideon Rose and only one citation to one of the most prominent French realist scholars that, uh, that you have. And I think this imbalance suggests that there is sort of a, a massive import of theoretical knowledge from the United States, whereas you tend to sort of disregard the contributions that come out of Europe. That is not worthwhile citing, apparently. But that's just a few uh, comments for now, because uh, there's, uh, there's more on the program. Thank you. Um, uh, while listening to your speeches, I was thinking about the field in Turkey. Both Turkey and Greece we are, are situated at the periphery of the European international relations discipline. So I'm sure our Greek colleagues will evaluate the situation whether realist theory is dominated in Greece or not. But in case of Turkey, I can say that realism and its variants are dominating theories in Turkish IR scholarship. As opposed to Alex's uh, experience uh, in undergrad studies in Turkey, uh, the first theory we learned and the first theory we are teaching our students are realism and its uh, different variants. So it's the totally different situation and students need to find their ways to, for example, learn about social constructivism or post-structuralism, etc. So um, there's a, there, there are these trip surveys among the IR scholars and the consequent trip survey results indicated that such a trend in Turkey. However, uh, Turkish uh, scholars, they are not on the side of theory development or theoretical innovation. So we are, we are in Turkey mostly on the side of appliers, uh, as Kunut and Asla uh, refer in their, uh, their, their article. So um, 
So mostly we conduct empirical analysis, mainly foreign policy analysis, employ, employing the variants of realism. Thus, it's quite interesting for me to hear that realism is almost non-existent in the European IR uh, center. Anyways, now I um, let me stop here and I would like to pass uh, the word to our roundtable panelists. I would like to give floor first to uh, Professor Papa Sotiriu from Institute of International Relations in Athens, which is one of the host institutions of this roundtable. After Prof. Uh, Harry, uh, we, we will turn uh, to floor to all our participants, particularly our experts in the roundtable, for uh, to hear their inputs, their questions, and their comments about our uh, realism. So now I would like to give floor to uh, Harry, please. Just want to make three points. And the first is related to what you just said. Mercer once said, there are no realists in Europe, but he said, there are realists in Greece. <laughs> he sells books in Greece. <laughs> we brought him two or three times for conferences and he was very popular. Of course, if Greece was between uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, probably there would be much fewer realists, right? I mean, if you're in a dangerous neighborhood with the Yugoslav wars in the nineties, several wars now in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the attention with Turkey, okay, I don't want to dwell on that now, but, but if you are in this kind of neighborhood, then you tend to be more focused on international conflicts, and that's what realism focuses on, right? If you're in Belgium or the Netherlands, you want to focus on why there's so much cooperation, why the Belgians don't think that they're going to be invaded any during their lifetime, right? or be in a war. So that's, I think that's very much... Uh, where, where you live and how near conflicts you live affects you. The second is a, a point that uh, Professor Reichwein, uh, very interesting name, by the way, <laughs> Professor Reichwein. Eh? Uh, realism, strictly speaking, is a theory about how the world works rather than how we want it to work. So Francis Bacon once uh, wrote, we are much obliged to Machiavelli for telling us how things are rather than how they ought to be. Right. And, and it, realism does that well. Uh, let me give a few examples. You have the Catholic Cardinal Richelieu allying himself with the Protestant Germans and the Muslim Ottomans against the Catholic Habsburgs. But he can't explain that except for the distribution of power. The Habsburgs were the threat for France, therefore he pushed aside ideology. The same after Bismarck United Germany, the most Republican France with the most absolutist Russia. It did their own towns. And more recently, when the Soviet Union seemed to be growing ever more powerful, the capitalist Nixon went to the much more extreme Maoist, the much more extreme the Soviet Union ideologically. They sort of aligned themselves against the Soviet Union. This is the kind of thing that realism does well. But people confuse realism sometimes with nationalism or with uh, Hitlerism, you know, trying to conquer everything. Now, that's not realism. There's nothing realist about Hitler. If you read <laughs> Mein Kampf or whatever, he wasn't thinking as a realist. He was very ideological. Uh, and the third point I want to make uh, uh, about the EU. It is true that the dominant form of political organization of mankind today is the nation state. This was not always the case and it may not remain the case. Now, the only way I think that a realist can handle the European Union, if the European Union at some point becomes a power on its own. It's a phenomenon at the moment, truly a realist cannot explain, but if the member states evolved the way the 13 colonies, the American colonies evolved, and they were, was far from predetermined that they would unite. I mean, before the 18, uh, sorry, the 1760s, each colony had relations with the mother, with the metropolis, rather than with each other. They had very few relations with each other, each in a different political system, different political traditions, came from a different uh, ideological part of English society, right? I mean, were, Massachusetts and Virginia were from different sides of the English Civil War. Virginia, result of the Royalist South England gentry, Massachusetts, the Puritans of East Anglia, who fought against King Charles, and yet managed to unite, even though they were very different as uh, 
qualities. And so if at some point the European Union manages to become a power player, rather than just a soft power player, I mean a hard power player. In, in economics, it, is, it can be said to be a hard power player, but I mean, in, even in military terms. Like, then uh, it will be more a phenomenon that realists can uh, cope with or, or explain. But not at the moment, with the whole European integration, unless you accept an argument that the Americans did it uh, to unite Western Europe against the Soviet Union. That would be a realist argument. It would not be entirely false. The Marshall Plan has is a precondition that uh, the West Europeans established free trade between themselves. It was the beginning of European economic integration. I stop here uh, and I look forward to hearing to other colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your valuable input, uh, Dr. H Professor Harry. So uh, who else uh, would like to uh, give floor? Evran Ojam? Would you like to put your input? Yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm really glad to be uh, part of this meeting. Uh, and it was a fascinating article. Um, it's a thought-provoking provo article, just like Alexander put it. Uh, so thank you uh, for your academic labor uh, to Asle and Knut Eric. Uh, I just read it. I wish I read it way earlier. Uh, but um, I have a few uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I think we can, uh, normally when I'm teaching different theories to students, I'm really striving to convince them uh, to believe something non-realist or un unrealist. I'm trying to, when I'm trying to teach them Marxism, when I'm trying to teach them post uh, positivist theories, feminist theories and other kind of stuff, I feel like, um, I feel like I'm, a content during the uh, class. But at the end of the class, when I ask the students, so what do you think? Or what are your questions? Or what are, um, did I, ch I'm asking them such questions to find an answer whether I change their minds about the operation of international politics. But they generally non-challengely non dismiss uh, so they continue to believe the realist, the power politics of international relations. So uh, I'd rather say international relations textbooks, probably we can say them they're pretextbooks for realist school. So as you put it, they're just pretexts and realism is embedded in them and a kind of power politics uh, is dormant and in the everyday life of lay people. So lay people, not just the bureaucrats, and lay people themselves, they find easy answers to complex situations in world politics through realism. So in textbooks, they just give these simple answers not at the theoretical level, but at the applica uh, application level. So I'm unable to convince my students sometimes. I just uh, find a few young minds, uh, I mean, to offer them Jedi ship or something like that, because we generally believe that realists are Sith Lords. Well, anyway, uh, I'm sure Alexander will not like this uh, comment, <laughs> but uh, Alexander put it rightly, I think, that um, the realism is not just a theory, but also a kind of narrative offering a restraint against power politics, rather than arguing that power politics is something good, realists in general, at least they are trying to offer a kind of restraint so uh, I find realism, rather than a theoretical application, a kind of, just like you put it in the article, a kind of traditional wisdom 
uh, offering a restraint and offering order rather than new kind of uh, alignments. So uh, I don't think that up until now, I disagreed neither with Asli and Knut Eric uh, nor with Alexander. But still, uh, I have two questions for you. Do you agree, Alexander, I'm sorry, I'm asking you first. <laughs> Do you agree that realism is rather than a theoretical tradition, a kind of um, applicational wisdom or narrative about power politics? Because its theoretical dimension is uh, at the same time very broad, but also very narrow. And to Asli and Knut, uh, you argue that, again, I really like to put it, I wish I read it much earlier. It, it really is thought provoking. Uh, I really like the idea. I really like the way you provoke, the, provoke all of us. Uh, but if lay people, including bureaucrats and others, continue to believe power politics, the play of power politics. This will not reinvent or contribute something new to the realist tradition or whatsoever, but it will, will it, won't it be reinforcing the application of it? So realism will end in terms of theoretical re-innovation. Yes, I believe so. But in terms of application, uh, Will it continue to reinforce itself? I'm uh, I know uh, in the article, you're not really arguing what I'm asking, but still I'm just trying to provoke in, in this narrow direction. And secondly, you argue that uh, realism has never been uh, dominant uh, in European school, uh, but Alexander's example is very interesting because during textbooks, during uh, textbook, textbook studentship, uh, they never heard about realism because it was embedded. No need to hear about realism itself because it was embedded and dormant in a textbook. So it was not theoretically uh, dominant, but in a sense, in a dormant way, practically dominant, was it? And secondly, you also say that uh, even Barry Busen moved from realist school towards English school, but to what extent English school is so different than realism? Isn't it a cross between, uh, a, a theory cross between realism and liberalism? So Barry Busen did not, uh, change its position that much. It just uh, contributed it or slightly changed its position through a liberal kind of understanding in English school. But um, if you think that English school is really a different kind of theoretical agent that, then realism, of course, um, I'm not talking about, I don't know what I'm talking about. Then. <laughs> so uh, this is my, these are my points, and thank you very much, uh, thank you very much uh, for your um, fascinating article, really. Thank you. Thank you, Evran. Uh, I think to, tonight's word will be thought-provoking. <laughs> thank you for thought-provoking questions to, or thought-provoking article. <laughs> so um, I guess now, um, Alexander, Knut, and Asla, uh, you may have time to answer uh, everyone's questions, plus maybe if you have any comments on Harry's comments. So please, the floor is yours. First yours, Alexander, and then Knut and Asla. Yeah, very briefly, um, Asla. Um, you're right. I mean, realists uh, are struggling with the European Union, for sure. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think realists can explain the internal power balancing situation uh, between member states. Uh, 
realists can explain uh, why uh, uh, Europe uh, is now rather dominant and uh, that the European Union was once uh, um, founded in order to control and to balance uh, Germany. You all know this historical stuff. The realists, uh, include Eric mentioned uh, um, some uh, realist work on European Union, European integration. So realists, we as realists, we struggle with the European Union on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, we can try to either explain the internal dynamics, for example, the Brexit, or we can treat the European Union as a powerful actor uh, when it comes to the relations to China, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and other parts of the world, Iran. So this is maybe what you call theoretical innovation. So you invited us to do this. So let's see what will happen. And um, uh, to, uh, to Knut Eric, uh, yes, this is really crazy that uh, there are so many art scholars labeling themselves realists, but they do not publish. This could mean three things. You do not need to publish outside Germany in order to be an art scholar at university. So in Germany, it's quite different. You have to publish and to publish and to publish. Uh, but this could secondly also mean that many, many IR scholars explain and analyze uh, international politics or foreign policy with realist categories, but they do not use the word realist. Could, uh, just think about Hans-Peter Schwarz's work on the Zentralmacht Europa or Zentralmacht uh, Deutschland. Uh, I, 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 I use this text from the end of the 80s and the mid of the 90s in order to make uh, students aware of the realist uh, perspectives on German foreign policy. And then they read Hans-Peter Schwarz and they are looking for this realist categories and they do not find it because he hide it, so to say, the realist categories behind his words for quite obvious reason. He was a German professor in Germany and he wrote in the end of the 80s and the 90s and he was, I think, rather uh, defensive uh, to use realist categories because of the political situation and the historical situation we have talked about. So maybe this could be an explanation for this or people do not know that they are realists, which, which would be a very interesting uh, situation, so to say, because constructivists are very aware of this because every constructivist studies begins with a sentence from a constructivist perspective, I will now explain or analyze or whatever. So maybe this is a kind of social practice. And uh, to, um, uh, to uh, um, Evren's uh, points, yes. I think, I mean, neorealism is a theory about international politics, war's work, uh, and Mersheimer's offensive realism is, uh, I think, a theory about power politics. But classical realism, I think it is not a theory. It became a theory because you all know that the six principles of political realism was introduced into the second edition of power uh, politics among nations. Morgenthau was rather forced to do this because the book was not sold because nobody was interested in a 500 page uh, European history. And then he wrote this first chapter, the six, six principles, and it was cited 2 million times, I do not know. So this was a strategic choice of the publisher Knopf in New York, but also of Morgenthau. Uh, there is a lot of interesting, fascinating work on this. Uh, there's an article from Crystal from 2009 about this introducing the six principles uh, in the uh, second edition. And we can, until today, try to make sense of it and to argue why Morgenthau did this, um, because he was rather interested in history and in philosophy. And I would add, add the word, Evan, you say, realism is a wisdom about statecraft, a, a wisdom about foreign policy, yes. Uh, it's a critique against reckless power politics, I argue yes, and I would add something. It is a reform project, a reformist project, Scheuermann used this word. It was reformist in Germany in the 20s and 30s to bring Germany back on the how to say, a uh, community of, uh, of states uh, and into the League of Nations. Then it was a reformist project in order to, um, to, to deal with the social question in Germany uh, at the end of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s. Morgenthau did write about this, unfortunately in German and in French, and nobody did read this stuff. And then later, Morgenthau used uh, the realism as a reformist project against the Vietnam War, against Wilson's democracy promotion, against Kissinger's Israel policy, and so on and so forth. So, Efren, you're absolutely right. It's a normative, critical, how to say, wisdom. It's a kind of a political uh, project and not just an IR theory, classical realism. I stop it here. Thank you. Kunut? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I think it's a very important um, 
experience uh, that you have uh, had, uh, Evan, uh, because um, it seems to me that many teachers uh, share your experience. And um, the reason that it might be uh, as it is, is that your students, when they enter the gate uh, to your university, they have uh, heard about world affairs, international politics in a number of different ways. Um, some of them might have been following various media, whether it's uh, new newspapers, magazines, or TV channels. And if they sort of uh, watch various uh, TV channels, for example, in Turkey, maybe it's not surprising that they sort of come out with this impression that uh, this is sort of the real stuff. This is what really goes on. And everything else is just uh, an appearance. So it's, uh, it's, uh, so it becomes uh, the intuitive approach or the, the default approach. Then, of course, uh, I guess uh, the, the challenge for us the university teachers is to, to challenge the zeitgeist and uh, to uh, sort of uh, teach our students the various perspectives that you can put on the very same event or process or uh, actor. And uh, as, as you also emphasized that you do, uh, sort of uh, act as uh, a very good defense lawyer will do, namely uh, defend your client, whether it's your client is a post-structuralist or a realist or whatever, and then make it up to the students to, to decide uh, what they really think is the, the right answer. Um, one way to challenge the zeitgeist, I guess, would be to to avoid the textbook, because usually it's um, it's sort of um, adaptations of adaptations of adaptations, or copies of copies of copies. And uh, they sort of repeat the same uh, sentences uh, time and again in different languages, but it is the same sentences. So instead of uh, using a textbook, then maybe uh, ask your students to to read Morgenthau's critique of the Vietnam War, or Mearsheimer and Walter's critique of the Iraq War, and say, okay, these are very famous realists. They seem to be anti-war. How, how does that uh, figure with the sort of uh, the default approach? And uh, here we have Mr. E. H. Carr, as we've talked about. Apparently, he was in favor of appeasement because that, he hoped, would enable European states to avoid a great power conflict by selling off Czechoslovakia. And of course, great power conflict is of great value. So you can, you can understand sort of the price he was willing to pay as Brit only to sort of sell off a prawn in the, in the chess game. But still, then you have Mr. Nordlinger, the American uh, scholar who is uh, a big uh, fan of uh, isolationism. So he wrote an entire book in which he praised isolationism. And there is quite some realist thinking in isolationism as well. Don't get into foreign adventures. Don't get into conflicts that you don't have, where, uh, where uh, you don't have, uh, what is it? Um, we don't have uh, anything to do in that uh, dogfight over there across the, the continent. And also, uh, maybe ask them to read uh, uh, Thompson, Kenneth Thompson, and his uh, treatment of principles. He's highly, uh, highly critical of principles because principled people are sometimes the most unwilling to compromise. So he seems to be against principled conduct of foreign relations. At least he points out that there are both benefits and costs of being in favor of principles. Uh, conduct of foreign relations. So uh, these would be sort of uh, disturbances, uh, cognitive disturbances among your students. And they would maybe think twice about well, what they are actually, what they believe in, what is sort of the interesting position here. About the, the uh, possibility that uh, Alex opens up that uh, some realists sail under uh, a different flag. I think that is a very interesting um, idea. And uh, you gave some examples. Um, 
but it, it could be that sometimes realists morph into other theoretical traditions, at least in appearance. A uh, long time ago, it was pointed out that some of the behavioral scholars in the United States, okay, they applied uh, what they found to be very uh, fantastic uh, methodologies, but those methodologies were used to things that were realist premises. So deep down, they were not any different from Ockentau. They just applied a different methodology and different language and uh, it was uh, for that reason difficult to understand in the first place. Also, uh, if you look at uh, some uh, post-structuralists, uh, uh, I'll give you an example of Finland. Okay, they use the post-structuralist language, but if you sort of see what they share, what uh, is the consensus, then it is a deep concern about the boundary to Russia. And that might be seen as sort of a, a traditional realist concern. Boundaries, uh, that is uh, something that realists uh, care about uh, because uh, across the boundary there is uh, uh, some threats. Another example of the sailing on the different flag is that quite many critical uh, IPE scholars tend to buy into the materialism of realism. So Maybe if we sort of blur the picture and say, okay, these are containers that we have developed to put in scholars, except ourselves. They maybe are not as sort of container-like as they are presented to be. Maybe there is a lot of traffic going on between the containers and we should maybe pay more attention to what is going on between the containers or the categories than what characterize what, what's in them. But of course then, we only have that much time to teach our students and then it's so easy to uh, say, okay, there are five categories, so, 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 and these are the key characteristics of category one and so on and so forth. So it's understand why we do what we do, but maybe we should uh, sort of uh, disturb them a little bit more in the future. Thank you, Asla. Um, thank you uh, for the comments and questions. I uh, also would like to actually uh, talk uh, uh, about uh, what Bezan, uh, you mentioned about this survey, mainly the trip survey. And also uh, Professor Poposetrio uh, mentioned that also in Greece, uh, realism, as Mersheimer said, it's, uh, there are realists in Greece, realists in, <laughs> in Greece. So uh, yes, according to the survey and according to the hearts of uh, the, the scholars, uh, so uh, obviously, actually, the uh, trip survey is asking to the scholars what they feel, uh, which uh, theoretical uh, tradition they feel akin to, and of course, they declare that they uh, I mean, they consider themselves to be the realists, or uh, they they imagine that uh, others would think them uh, they belong to realist tradition, but uh, are they really fond of uh, theoretical uh, work? Are they really uh, fond of application of theory? Then I guess we should ask this question at this point, because then we actually come to the point uh, what Evren mentioned, uh, uh, because uh, he also mentioned that so there are many foreign policy analysis, so aren't they contributions? Can We cannot go accept them as contributions to realism. Um, Again, another, uh, uh, I, I guess, a critical point here because yes, uh, there is actually, a, uh, there are some ingredients of realism in this analysis, in this foreign policy analysis, but at the same time, there is also a shared ontology uh, among all these theorists, diplomats, politicians, journalists, so, I mean, don't you feel like, okay, there is something going on here? I mean, as a theory, I guess uh, it should actually, should be really creating a theory. Uh, and uh, I don't want to be like, the, you know, the elitist here, but at least uh, we should see what also uh, Professor Trio says about nationalism and realism, that the boundaries between these two uh, is important. So this is also about misreading realism, so uh, misuse of realism. This that also brings me to the other point uh, about this uh, applicational wisdom, Evren said. 
and uh, I understand Alex uh, also agrees with uh, him, uh, but it's also about this very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, the, uh, like Guccini actually once pointed uh, about this problem, about this timeless wisdom, uh, because it actually this hurts, it, it hurts and it definitely not contributes into theory because uh, Guccini actually he asks, uh, he says that this is a dilemma uh, between, you know, this um, uh, political, uh, even actually pragmatic, uh, practical knowledge and uh, scientific rigor. And he says that unfortunately the contemporary realists actually uh, went for this uh, practical knowledge. So this actually uh, is actually similar to the thinking of uh, thinking of timeless wisdom, because if you accept realism as a narrative, timeless narrative, if you actually bring back theory from its theoretical origin and then just uh, situate it as a narration up there, as a wisdom up there, which doesn't have any time, if it is timeless, it actually takes back the possibility of innovation because it is timeless. Why do you create something new? You already have one, already. It's over there, it's timeless wisdom. So this kind of thinking uh, of realism is also, uh, I guess, let alone contributing, taking away the theoretical uh, contribution possibilities, I guess. Okay, so, so far, these are the points. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh Last but not least, we have one more panelist in our round table, Efi uh, Haralampaki from International, uh, International Studies Center in uh, Athens. So Efi, please, uh, we, we look forward to hear your input too. Uh, I'm not from the International Studies uh, Center in Athens. Uh, I, I am sure. I have theory working group, which is uh, the research group uh, I direct at the, uh, in the Institute. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody. It's a great honor for me for having me here. Uh, particularly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Knud Jorgensen and Dr. Ali Jorgensen, and uh, of course, Dr. Papasotiriu for hosting the event, and of course, Dr. Buhari and Dr. Uh, Paskun for organizing uh, this beautiful event. And I hope we are going to have more workshops like that because they're very important for um, uh, discussing and uh, evolving IR theory for those of us who are very interested in IR theory. Um, pretty much I'm here uh, to support the arguments and the agenda of Dr. Uh, Jorgensen and Dr. Ashley uh, Jorgensen. I really enjoyed their paper. I'm not a realist myself. Um, pretty much I'm going to say uh, relatively the same things like the previous speakers that realism and neorealism and even their more recent offspring uh, neoclassical realism are presented as uh, distinctively American traditions in IR theory, even though the philosophical underpinnings of realism are anchored in Europe, uh, Thucydides, Hobbes, Machiavelli, uh, Raymond Aron and others. And we can also say that liberal realism, which is the English school, uh, rationalism, are stemming from scholars and philosophers outside the American scholarly arena, such as Martin White, Henley Bull, and Barry Buzan. Uh, Dr. Knut Jorgensen and Dr. Ashley Jorgensen argue in their paper that, uh, and I have to say that I enjoy it very much, uh, there is no distinctive realist tradition in contemporary European IR scholarship. Despite the fact that the EU structure is experiencing processes and phenomena that clearly point to the real politic mindset and remind us of the ever present rationale of power, state, centrist, monarchy, uh, rational self interest, hegemony, or maintenance of the status quo, depending on the stream of neorealism, offensive or defensive, and so forth. Um, I think that uh, everybody touched upon. Uh, uh, these arguments. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would like, in order to support uh, uh, Dr. Jorgensen's uh, argument, 
uh, I would like uh, to draw from a famous article uh, of John Vasquez from 1997, The Realist Paradigm and Regenerative versus uh, Progressive Research Programs, an appraisal of non-traditional research on Walt's balancing proposition, and also draw from uh, other paradigms, from other theorists, from other paradigms of IR, in order to make a couple of points that will challenge the realists because this is ultimately what we have to do, those of us who are not a realists, in order to have a healthy realist agenda in the 21st century, which is lacking right now. In my view, uh, realism is, 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 out, is outdated. Um, so I dare to say that any IR theory, a theoretical paradigm has to be appraised according to certain criteria by examining the ability of the theories it generates to satisfy criteria of adequacy. And here we are, we are bringing in uh, Imre uh, Lakatos methodology of scientific research programs that also John Vasquez is using in his famous paper. So the primary criterion according to Imre uh, Lakatos methodology is the ability to produce progressive as opposed to degenerating research programs. And here I'm quoting John's, uh, John Vasquez directly. According to this rationale, therefore, the problem comes down to how to evaluate all the series of theoretical streams and propositions that are under the realist paradigm that share fundamental assumptions about how, about how the international system works or should work and direct foreign policy processes ultimately, test these assumptions and evaluate the progressive trajectory of the research program. Realism in this case, in an ever evolving and changing global order that is not static in any way, shape or form. This is because one of the major problems in IR theory is how to explain, measure and predict, and why not, change in the international system. And I refer you to uh, the famous paper by Holstein, okay. Um, uh, but also in other structural levels of analysis with the processes they generate that characterize the 21st century global order, such as micro interactions and micro macro interdependencies, connections, interactions, and the rational or non-rational behaviors that are produced strategically or, uh, or uh, randomly that challenge state sovereignty and security. So I remind everybody that one of the major problems of the realist research program in the 21st century Europe, as Dr. Uh, Reichwein uh, uh, pointed out before, uh, where there is a pervasive complex interdependence and interconnectedness, despite the turbulence that national agendas produce many times, is how to explain with a rigorous methodological agenda the profound entanglement of state and non-state actors in micro macro processes that are paramount for the viability of security and economic governance structures that ensure the viability and survival of the 21st century uh, nation state. And here we have, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, crisis that has clearly shown this, no state can go it alone in this era, despite its power and capabilities, and the stabilization of the global order ultimately cannot be based on the traditional uh, Waltonian balance of power rationale. Uh, the, uh, we all know that it maintains that the self-help system stimulates uh, states to behave in ways that tend toward the creation of balance of power, and, which is something not even Morgan thought, and I refer you to chapter 14 of his famous book, Politics Among Nations, not even Morgan thought supports uh, this notion. Okay, so uh, Waltz sees this balancing act as an axiom, and uh, he proposes it to be. Uh, and even uh, drawing from another paradigm from constructivism that uh, other uh, discussants uh, referred to before, even Alexander Wendt uh, has repeatedly guided us um, that the Darwinian logic of evolution has interesting affinities with Foucault's uh, view of power as something that produces agents but does not belong to them. Therefore, um, according to Wendt and according to uh, many uh, uh, progressive trends in IR theory, uh, patterns of effects are explained not so much by choices or even intentionality as by the properties of the system as a whole. Explanations of this form, uh, according to Watts, are structural. But if interactions has also structure and their effects are different than the system as a whole, uh, we immediately have two levels of structure that must account for foreign policy processes. 
the macro and the macro structure. So realism tends to focus on the macro and uh, especially neorealism. This is uh, something very representative with uh, Watts theory which, uh, in his famous 1979 book. Okay, so uh, uh, disregarding the micro, despite, despite the discussion about Watts second image inside which the agency of leaders and bureaucrats is taken into account, uh, which presupposes that wars are caused by the domestic make makeup of nation states. So, uh, going back to appraising, and uh, I'm sorry for taking uh, this time, but we, we have uh, we have to uh, pose some questions that we will challenge the realists here. So, uh, going back to appraising the realist paradigm according to Imre Lakatos methodology and John Vasquez rationale, we need a progressive trajectory for any IR theory in order to stand the test of time and the test of evolution of a turbulent global order. We see it clearly now with the pandemic and with other processes like uh, climate change, uh, financial crisis, and so forth. So forth. So uh, th therefore, realists must show us how the logic of the original or reformulated theory can account for the uh, discrepant evidence and then uh, delineate how this paradigm can give rise to new propositions and predictions or observations that the original theory did not anticipate. Uh, we saw that with the Cold War, okay? We have numerous paradigms in the past, especially with Muriel, with Watts theory. Uh, so it seems that reality today lacks of progressive uh, theory shifts, using Lakatos terminology, that are not protean shifts, according to Vasquez. Therefore, and here I'm going to bring John Vasquez's rationale uh, full uh, in the discussion because I feel it's, it's brilliant. Uh, and uh, this is what is going to challenge the realists in our panel and maybe they can answer uh, this um, uh, rationale. So uh, the generation of its protean character of its theoretical uh, development. We see that with uh, realists. Uh, so uh, what they have to do, realists show an unwillingness to specify what constitutes the true theory, according to Vasquez. This is very important for the rest of us who would like to reject it because we need to know in order to test its falsification. If we don't do this process, we cannot have an IR theory. And this is the, the major problem in IR theory. That's why we, don't, we do not have a grand theory in IR. Okay. And many times uh, we are blamed that uh, this is not science. So, um, According again to Baskins, there should be a continual adoption of supplementary propositions to explain flaws. And finally, there is a shortness of strong research findings, which is the primary indication of a degenerative agenda, especially in the 21st century Europe. Um, do I have any more time, Bezen, or should I, should I stop here? Uh, if you can wrap up in like one, two minutes. Okay, thank you. So, um, I, I, had, I had many thoughts here, especially, you know, like, uh, because I'm not a realist, I'm coming from the uh, global governance and globalization studies, uh, being a student of James Rosano um, and a researcher for him, and he was my mentor for so many years, so I'm embedded in this paradigm. So the only thing I could do is just come here and challenge the realists. So what I'm going to say is that um, uh, there is a need for a post-hegemonic and post-turbulence conceptualization of what James Rosano called in his turbulence theory, a plausible extrapolation of the micro and macro dynamics that leads to a cyclical theory of the two world universe in which the pace of change is unrelenting even as both world, uh, worlds persist intact. Can realism explain, therefore, the dynamics of change according to the two world order model of James Rosano that is fully applicable uh, to the 21st century world order so that these dynamics evolve into a patterned sequence in which the tendencies of centralization, decentralize, decentralization, excuse me, shift the balance between the state centric and multi, multi centric worlds? In multi-centric worlds here, James Rosano included uh, non-state actors and so many other processes that we see in the 21st century. So uh, with periods of whole system dominance preceding and the following periods of subsystem dominance. 
Can realism ultimately explain shifts between change and continuity along systemic and cyclical lines as the centralizing tendencies or the state-centric system fluctuate inversely with the decentralizing forces of the multi-centric world where we have entities without sovereignty that today are challenging uh, state uh, sovereignty and state power, they hold no legitimacy also. Uh, a prime example is ISIS. So this remains to be seen. And I, I challenge the realists, the distinguished uh, panelists, um, to develop a research agenda as such, and then Vasquez will be proved, proven wrong. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me and for uh, listening to these thoughts. Thank you Effie, for uh, your valuable comments and the input. Uh, it's appreciated. Now we have three uh, questions uh, on the row. First, uh, Burcu Sarı Karademir, and then Evren Eken, and then Duran Doğan. After taking their questions, I will turn it to uh, Flor, to Kunut, and Asla to uh, response uh, their questions and also Effie's input. Thank you. Burcu? Merhabalar, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation and very stimulating discussion. And I think this question is going to come just in a right time because I was going to ask uh, why we need a European realism. And maybe European realists are doing their way of theorizing because theorizing, when we talk about theorizing, uh, how we understand theorizing, it seems like here a little bit American kind of theorizing. Maybe uh, Europeans are doing theorizing as history. Maybe they are mingling history as theory or they are disguising their theory in um, history. So we have to uh, understand European way of doing theory is not immune from the study of history itself. Maybe it is a healthier way of doing theory on its own. So history, the use of history, the way we theorize, uh, I think that the, the European approach here is very illustrative in itself. So why we have to straightjacket the theorizing in itself uh, in, in the body of American theorizing. So uh, this is something that I, come to my mind. And when you discuss this you, you, history discussions or uh, when we talk about E.H. Carr or uh, how different he, he is in terms of a uh, theorizer, uh, how different realist he is. Actually, he is different because he, he historicized realism. He's an historical person and all the historical, uh, you know, the big names of realism they did and they explained realism in the language of history. Maybe there is a normative reason that uh, they don't do, they don't teach history, uh, they don't teach realism as a theory in, Amer uh, in European land, because when they teach uh, realism, they know uh, how it's going to turn in politics to them. Maybe this time they are doing a, a different kind of uh, realism. Maybe if we look at, uh, if we define realism as, you know, uh, accumulation of power. So European Union, European integration studies are themselves can be considered as uh, maybe uh, realist pol policies. So we have to also uh, question what is real politic if it's uh, in terms of, you know, accumulation of power. So uh, we are uh, criticizing China for hiding its power, biding its time and changing its policies, accumulating power. So maybe it is also European Union that is taking its time and accumulating power. So there are different ways of doing uh, power politics. So why don't we think uh, European uh, scholars and their European studies, integration studies as under the under the umbrella of real politics? Maybe, maybe this is one of the questions that we need to discuss. That's, that's something that was very provocative for me to think. Uh, I think uh, the way we teach, the way we do theory and the history is something very, very crucial at the heart of this discussion. So I would like to uh, bring it to after Effie's, uh, uh, Professor Effie's uh, question, because uh, when you talk about degenerative or progressive research agenda, or uh, when we talk about this uh, very famous, um, uh, this article of Moravshik, uh, when they talk about, the, is there anyone still a realist? So they are dealing with this realism question on their own. But um, there are big discussions. I think no one in, 
are um, claims to be realist only nowadays. They are all after you know eclectic, eclectic studies. They are considering the realist constructivism, combining realism with constructivism, looking for alternative ways of doing theory. And uh, historical sociological uh, studies are very dominant nowadays. So uh, maybe we shouldn't be uh, straight jacketing theorizing as uh, you know, American or you know, realism in different uh, clothes. And I think uh, Europeans are doing great uh, realist studies there. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, it's getting better and better, more provoking questions and challenging challenges. Thank you, Burju. And now, uh, Evren. Uh, thanks again. I'm just, I, I was just going to thank to uh, Knut Eric's uh, point. Uh, maybe, yes, we should dismiss the textbooks. Uh, and you also kind of mentioned what we are trying to do as a group of colleagues here, uh, how we are going to dismiss or um, undermine what uh, classical textbooks trying to sell to students. Uh, because yes, everyday life is replete with med uh, media's intrusions. And uh, students learn lots of things, so-called lots of things through media before they become international national students. And they are all sustaining the ba basic tenets of uh, power politics. So yes, dismiss the textbooks. It was a good, uh, good thing to call for. Uh, and next to uh, Alexander, uh, thanks for your answer again. Yes, modernism, uh, sorry. Yes, realism is a kind of wisdom, offering wisdom, offering restraint and other kind of stuff. But you also said that it's very important. It's a kind of reforms project, right? Reforms project to contain, to give order to the situation around the world. Uh, because it's a hodgepodge of everything. And realism offered that uh, states are able to contain the dynamic hodgepodge of everything in world politics. But it's a modernist project. That's the problem. This reformation, this, uh, this reform project, is a modern institutionalization project, it's a modern project and it creates new problems. Yes, it solves some uh, certain problems, but also it creates new ones. That's the problem. That was why I was just uh, gently tapping you to this position. Uh, don't you think? The modernism is the basic problem here. So, well, anyway, uh, and sorry, the third thing is, I think one of my questions is uh, forgotten about English school. To what extent is English school is not a contribution towards re realist theory? Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we have last two questions or comments. Uh, first from Diran and then Dita. Diran. Diran, are you there? Okay. Okay, Didam, you go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for this inspiring article. And I hear your message is that we have a problem, we have to solve it. it realism needs some innovative, creative thinking, and maybe some ontological shift, uh, as Effie highlighted the new transformations in the world. Even we are talking about post-humanism now in IR. So how will realism renew itself and adjust to the global transformations? There are at least three ways of doing this. First, European realism may help, maybe. As Alexander has already kindly suggested, there are some developments in progress, such as this neoclassical realism 
which is also very exciting for scholars in Turkey. I should say it's very popular. But when we look at John Mearsheimer's response to this new development of uh, neoclassical realism, at ISA Baltimore conference, he, I witnessed him personally saying that this neoclassical realism harms realism, you know, rather than helping it. And second way of solving our problem of creativity in realism may be incorporating some non-Western realists. Maybe we should think about Confucius as moral realist, but I'm not sure, but I don't see much curiosity and interest in the mainstream real, realist paradigm about non-Western realist ways of thinking. And third, we, we may perhaps as non-realist scholars of IR, we may help realism find its way to adjust to the changing world. So this is just a comment or a question. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dina. Tiran, uh, can you ask your question now? Uh, I will write it. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Dran is writing your questions, but in the meantime, uh, maybe we can start uh, hearing uh, your responses, starting from uh, Kunut, Aslı, and Alex. Okay. <clears throat> One important question that was raised uh, by Bodju uh, uh, is, uh, what is actually the need for uh, realism in Europe? And... Um, it might sound uh, strange, uh, but uh, I actually do believe that there is such a need. And uh, the reason is that uh, I think that um, crossing or bridging on the one hand um, European studies and on the other hand international relations. It's my experience that on the European studies side, not many have made the move that Morgenthau made back in 1929, when he realized that a legal analysis of worldly issues is okay, but is, is also insufficient. There is this thing called politics, there is this thing called power. And for sure there is a hegemony in European studies where politics, especially power politics, do not play any role whatsoever. Where uh, every uh, development in say EU foreign policy is explained by reference to some institutional development or some legal competences. And that is simply not good enough in my view. There we need to be able to draw on a realist tradition and explain what needs to be explained in Europe's conduct towards other actors in the world. Of course, this also um, links to, uh, to Harry's comment that when you are surrounded by conflicts, okay, then you are looking for theories that can explain conflicts. That's a natural uh, move uh, to, to select some theories or some theoretical perspective that you believe can help you explain the situation in which you are. So basically that is what I see as a need for realism to play a role in Europe. And for that reason, realists in Europe should do it better and do it more. I would also like to uh, comment on uh, Effie's point because uh, again uh, it's possible here to, to link to uh, Alex's uh, opening statement where he said that well, uh, Lise Jorgensen's, they got it wrong because realism actually is a very colorful uh, thing, it's not a sort of one church thing, there are many different orientations and uh, schools of thought within the broad umbrella that is called realism rightly so we agree that's why we talk about a realist theoretical tradition. And the tradition is 
not celebrating, but at least characterized by multiplicity. A, a tradition, a theoretical tradition, cannot possibly be coherent. There's always dissonance, turbulence, disagreements, different perspectives being cultivated. Of course, it should be different for a single theory. That should be coherent, and that should live up to uh, Vasquez's uh, criteria for what is a good theory. A theory as such cannot be self-contradictory, at least when it's a bad theory. It's also for that reason that I believe that Vasquez's critique but also Morgenthau's critique of realism is slightly unfair because he points to various realists around the world, especially in the United States. And then he say, well, they don't sort of agree on the many different issues. The observation is correct, but why expect in the first place that they would agree? And why expect that any theoretical tradition is coherent in itself? That is not possible. Liberals disagree about all sorts of things. IPE scholars disagree about all sorts of things. But they agree that they have a liberal orientation or a realist orientation or an IPE orientation. That is what connects them. But apart from that, they disagree about everything. So realism, if it is to be criticized, and uh, we obviously believe that that is... Uh, a good, uh, that is a worthwhile activity, then it should be criticized on some uh, fair, uh, in a fair fashion, and not uh, something that you cannot possibly expect. It is also for that reason that I believe that the concept of uh, paradigm is a little bit, in this context at least, a little bit uh, misleading. And uh, it is uh, maybe the beginning of the problems that Vasquez's article is characterized by. I think it is uh, significant or telling that uh, Kuhn, when he got this idea to write his book, his famous book about uh, paradigms, then the reason that he got that idea is that he moved from the sciences and he ended up among some social scientists. And he was flabbergasted because they didn't, they didn't agree about anything. And how could that be that they still do some science? And then he began to think about, oh, how is it that people in one scholarly community actually can agree about something like in the sciences, at least until they agree about something else, this paradigm shift. But whereas in the social sciences and I guess also the humanities, it is a completely different game. And if you don't sort of get that, then everything is um, uh, <laughs> problematic. And of course, it's not because we are in the sciences. We know that, uh, okay, there are actually some solid foundations, even if we di disagree about many things. So I think that is what I would like to say for now. Thanks. Thank you. Asla? Um, thank you. Thank you. I also would like to start with uh, Burg just Sarı Karadeniz, uh, very well formulated question here. Uh, why do we need a European realism? Uh, I mean, why don't we just, uh, maybe they do their own uh, way of theorizing. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the thing is that actually uh, theories are, or they shouldn't be that much messy. I mean, there should be, uh, it is called uh, a discipline, it is called a theory, and there should be some discursive approach here, there should be some contextualization, uh, internal discourse analysis, uh, or genealogical uh, methodology that you trust or a research area. So uh, these, of course, people who are working uh, uh, from a historical perspective and talking to realist arguments, uh, yes, they can talk about realism, but uh, I guess uh, it needs to be more to be accepted as, a, as part of uh, that tradition in Europe. By the way, we don't say European realism, we say realism in Europe because we do not have an uh, actually view to actually just uh, split geographically realism into continents. So realists in Europe. So that's uh, what I believe that it's, um, I mean, if they have a way 
uh, their own way. I guess that way uh, looks uh, too much symbolic or uh, too much uh, in secrecy. Uh, so we need some uh, really uh, theoretical work. Uh, and these works should be talking to each other. That's how we can actually find paradigms, theories, discipline. And uh, for Evran's question about uh, the English school, uh, so if it is a, a contribution or not to realism, uh, it is English school, it's not realism, it is English school. Yes, realism is part of the English school. Uh, actually, English school is based upon this idea of the dialogue between these traditions. Uh, so that is why actually Martin White, for example, uh, I mean, uh, one of the founders of, the, of this idea, this discipline uh, is actually uh, also contributing, was contributing, uh, contributed to uh, realism uh, immensely. So, uh, but I guess we should, uh, I mean, separate the English school. And uh, uh, so I don't know, of course, it's open for uh, ideas and other discussions here, but uh, that's what I believe. And Busan, uh, yes, actually he sh sh shifted uh, his position. Uh, he uh, came to the English school, but I also should raise a question about his, uh, I mean, middle position within the English school, because whenever I read his actually ideas about world society, uh, he actually sounded more like a realist to me than uh, a liberal, because uh, but that's not a very, uh, you know, solidarist or liberal idea, because he also raised this uh, interesting points about nation state and its interests and uh, pluralism. So within this context, uh, uh, yes, they, they, I mean, English School is partly realism, and realism contributed to English school, but they are two different uh, theories for me. And uh, for Didam's question about actually, uh, actually, uh, yes, I agree with uh, what, whatever you said about you know what to do about the contribution. Um, but uh, you said something about this neoclassical realism. Uh, uh, I guess I missed that part. Uh, uh, an academic uh, mentioned that it's a harm uh, for realism itself. It harmed realism. Um, but I'm not sure about uh, that uh, concept of harm, harming, because it's a rupture. That's right. Uh, it is a breakdown. It is a break. But I guess sometimes uh, these kind of, uh, you know, breakings, these ruptures uh, give the dynamism. And maybe that's why, uh, that's what the realists in Europe need. Uh, something like neoclassical realism, uh, not the one uh, in the US, not neo-realism uh, in the US, not classical realism, but something different, another rupture, another break, another uh, new path, which can actually contribute uh, to, uh, to realism. So thank you. Thank you, Asla. Alex, would you like to give some response to the, some of the comments that are directly relevant to you? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, I stopped to take care about articles in which the authors uh, try to evaluate um, realism or liberalism or any other theory, because I think this is not only senseless, I also think it uh, has also to do with intellectual arrogance, so to say. Though the Le Gromorovchik article is the horrible, most horrible article I've ever read because the message is that there are some theories which are all wrong and there's only one theory, which is the theory which can explain everything. And this is Andy Moravchik's liberal theory. I do not take this seriously, to be honest. I've never met Andy Moravchik, um, unfortunately, because I would like to discuss this uh, with him or I would at least uh, like to make my argument because this article is an example how we should not do IR theory, to be honest. Um, so the same is with Vasquez and other people who try to defend a certain way of realist thinking against other more or less innovative 
uh, ways to think about international politics from realist perspectives. And maybe this has to do with uh, the context in which we are doing IR theory, but I am uh, convinced about pluralism as a political and also uh, as an IR, um, so to say, academic um, value. And so I would rather call, and don't get me wrong, nobody of us here did argue against pluralism. I, I rather uh, try to address Andy Moravchik and, and, and some other guys who are not with us, unfortunately. Uh, I, I believe in pluralism. And this brings me to my second point. I think it makes sense to criticize neoclassical realism for being eclectic, for being uh, rather constructivist or liberals in a realist, uh, how to say, vein. And this brings the discussion on, and, and uh, this, this uh, makes uh, the discussion moving forward. And this is what Clude Eric and Asli, and also what we as IR scholars and uh, IR theorists uh, are claiming for, that we should not the whole life read Walls or Mersheimer's book. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's very uh, useful and it's worth to, to, to read, but there should be more um, stuff on offensive realism, defensive realism, uh, what is classical realism. So I think we should move on. Uh, when you read the International Studies Review Forum on Neoclassical Realism, please read the conclusion from Jennifer Sterling Foker, one of our great women in IR realism, uh, in the realist uh, camp. Uh, I see because you identify yourself as not in the realist camp. This is why I mention um, Jennifer Sterling Foker. And her argument is that it doesn't matter whether it is Marxism, liberalism, realism, institutionalism, English school, we should go on. And we should try to be innovative and we should uh, try to bring uh, these approaches or perspectives within the schools. And I can all uh, today, uh, I can only today um, uh, speak for the realist camp. We should bring this on uh, uh, and forward and then other people can react and can write articles about um, eclecticism and the degenerative research program, just to mention a few um, uh, arguments from uh, Vasquez and Moravchik uh, and Legro. And my third point is uh, to uh, Evren, yes, it is modernism. Hannah Arendt and Hans Morgenthau and all these European Jewish emigres, they struggle with modernism because modernism was not only Kant, but also Auschwitz, as we all know. And I think about the famous argument from Sigmund Baumann that Auschwitz was the result of modernism. I do not buy this argument, don't get me wrong, but there is a strong argument uh, made by this famous uh, sociologist. And so you are right. And if I got you right, then you can make the argument. Realism is a very Western thinking, a very Western styled mode of thinking. And what Knud Eric and Felix Resch and Helen Turton and Audrey Alejandro and me try to do in our Powerwave book series about the European traditions is, first of all, we should identify ourselves as Europeans and we, sh we, we should know who we are and where we are in order to start then a global discourse. And we anticipated, Knud Eric, that we will get criticism as uh, being Europeanists and Eurocentric and so on and so forth. But this is not our point. The point is that, first of all, European IR scholars should be aware of the fact that they are European liberal theorists, like Knud Eric and his team in his book. And then we can, and we should, and this is a normative, so to say, claim, start a debate about liberalism in IR. And then we should invite all the people who are not part of this European capitalist democratic a part, but of other parts in the world. And the same is with realism in the classical understanding, so to say, because Mersheimer does not care about modernism eh? or something like this. Uh, you are talking about classical realism. And so this brings me to my last point. It doesn't matter whether we are liberals, we are liberal, but you know, I are uh, theory liberals. And it doesn't matter whether we are English school uh, theorists or realists or whatever. We should be every day normative, critical, reflexive about what we are doing and what we are theorizing and what we are explaining and what we are analyzing and what we are claiming and what we are prescribing. And we should, so to say, every day, try to make our theoretical perspective a bit more reflexive, more critical, more open-minded. We should test it. We should ask ourselves, is this a good argument that nation states rule the world. And if not, we should 
rethink our theory. And to be honest, Morgenthau did this because Morgenthau was asking all this question. He was a fan of neo-functionalism. He wrote the foreword of a working peace system. Who knows this at German universities? Nobody except me. Sometimes it seems to me. And then people are surprised. He really did this. It was William Scheuermann, an American scholar who writes a book about Morgenthau as a neo-functionalist in 2009. And this is crazy, isn't it? Because it seems to me that in Germany, I ask people, I ask scholars, do either not care about this or they do not want to care about it, which would be very problematic, or they are just not interested in this because it's much more easier to say, realists are power theorists and constructivists are norm theorists and liberals do the rest. And this is too easy, so to say, to be honest. And so this brings me to my very final and last point. We should start to rethink ourselves, not in a substantial way that we should uh, stop or end theorizing, but we should ask ourselves, what is my favorite of, what, what is my preferred theory? What is my approach within theory? And then we should start to say, how much can I explain? And this brings me to my uh, point uh, to, um, uh, to Ify. Um, realists should not start to explain everything. This is John Merchamas point. We should still try to explain security issues. Uh, we should, as classical realists, explain democracy and the internal domestic, so to say, area of foreign policy. When you are a defensive neorist, you should explain balance of power stuff and so on and so forth. Because when we start to explain everything from a liberal or realist or conservative perspective, then we lost content, then we lost sense, then we lost how to say, uh, a way of thinking. And it's not that everybody should be a realist. And it's not that realists should not think about the pandemic or, uh, or environmental stuff. But we should try, first of all, to explain what is in the core of our theory. And then we can think about how to move on. Is maybe COVID or environmental stuff a security concern? And if we can explain it. And if not, we should leave this to other theorists. So again, I'm praying, so to say, for an intellectual academic pluralism in IR theories. And this makes articles like Rukro and Moravchik useless, senseless, and to be honest, not so productive. Okay, thank you. Uh, with Alexander's comments, I think we have covered all the questions and interventions. Uh, before closing down, actually, I would li like to give floor to Harry uh, if you have any last comments or any uh, inputs before closing uh, the session. I agree very much with Alexander's uh, last points. Uh, of, of course, as I said, realism explains conflict, not uh, more cooperative forms of international mm -hmm. relations. Therefore, I don't think we should think in terms of I am a realist and that's it. It's, what, what's my question? Which approach can answer my question better? You know, that should be the approach, I think. Okay. I deal with conflict, so you see, but if I dealt with other aspects of IR, then uh, realism may not have been so useful to me. It's a base. Okay, um, great then. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank all of you, uh, Kunut and Aslı for the paper, for the presentations and Alexander for brilliant uh, discussion on uh, your paper. And all of our panelists, uh, uh, Harry, Effie and Evran. So Burju, uh, thank you for your uh, intervention uh, and also all the students here to listen to us. Uh, I think we have like, full two hours full of realism. I think now we have lots, lots to think about it. <laughs> about realism, about IR theories and about life and everything. So I would like to thank you all. Uh, now it's time to close our uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Very, Good night. Very. Good night. Thank you very thank much. You.